Well, hello, everyone. Um, I know you're sort of just getting settled. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, you are here for the Rady MBA SIP session featuring Kim Pendergrass, a, a current MBA student uh, who is in her second year that has taken advantage of all um, many, many of Rady's entrepreneurial act, like resources as well as UC San Diego's resources. And we're gonna talk to her a little bit more, but I did wanna sort of just briefly um, introduce myself. My name is Christina Cook. Um, I am uh, with admissions and recruiting here at MBA as is my colleague, Gerard Vernalis, who's right next to me in little upper left corner square. And uh, he too is with admissions and recruiting. So um, this, this session will last approximately 45 minutes. Um, you will have time to ask questions at the end. Um, you can also ask questions throughout, but if, if you do so, please raise your hand or, and you have the option of asking in the chat as well. We'll do our best to answer them as we move forward. Um, again, you know, that's the SIP session really is just a chance for, for you to get a better sense of who we are and you know, a little bit of our culture, but also get to see um, the inside of what happens you know, at an MBA program, specifically at Rady. And, you know, just things that, you, that are intangibles that you cannot access via the web or any other sort of internet resources. So um, with that said, I'm going to introduce Kim briefly and I'm gonna ask her to share more about herself. But as I mentioned, she is a second year MBA. Um, she hails from Oregon State with a, uh, a three bachelor's degrees, um, art history, marketing and international business. So she has a blend of uh, business and the, the liberal arts, which I'm a big fan of. And then obviously adding a STEM MBA is going to um, even uh, enhance that kind of educational portfolio even more. Uh, she was in marketing prior to coming to um, her MBA program. And then once she was here, I mean, I think she'd always hit the ground running. She started hitting the ground running, but she really started running fast when she started her MBA program here. So um, as I mentioned earlier, she did start a a blue economy company, a sustainable um, concept while she was here at Rady, and that's going to be the focus of, of what we're talking about today. So Kim, if you don't mind, I would love it if you shared a little bit more about yourself and kind of what led you to this place, and, and you know, we can go from there. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for that intro, Christina. That was really nice. Hi, everyone. As you know, my name's Kim Pendergrass, and I am in the second year program I'm going to let Christina kind of guide our conversation, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat, and I guess I'll just start a monologue from there. So as Christina mentioned, my background um, is more of a liberal arts degree from Oregon State University. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. The reason I have so many bachelor degrees is because I was loving college at 22 and I did not really feel like leaving. Um, and eventually they told me, hey, pay for grad classes or get out of here. And so it was just a, a function of having that many credits. And I went to a, a good public high school that got you a lot of college credits too before you graduated. So nothing too special there on that end. But what I did go to school for at Oregon State was they had a really strong entrepreneurship program. So I was telling Christina before I started, um, or before we started the session today, that I really wanted to be a fine artist um, when I was in high school, and that's what I thought I would do. And eventually it occurred to me that I would never eat, have a paycheck, or leave my parents' house if I didn't get some other kind of background. So I went to Oregon State to study international business in marketing. Um, I thought that was a good blend of kind of a creative passion, and I really wanted to travel. And at that point in my life, I hadn't traveled a lot. So that was kind of that. Immediately after school, <clears throat> my reality shock set in and I needed to get a job. I was not good in my undergrad about doing internships. I spent most of my summers traveling um, abroad as a dirty backpacker instead. And so when it came time to get a job, I completely lucked into getting a job at a startup as employee 15 in marketing. And at that point, you know, I had learned marketing in undergrad. I didn't really know what marketing was. And it's uh, it's best and it's broad. And so in that startup, I really got a chance to grow up. And so I was with them for eight years. I started um, as their first marketer and I eventually led to growing the marketing department, hiring uh, team members, building out, and then exited as the head of marketing eight years later, um, one year post acquisition uh, from a large public company. And so startup life was awesome. 
Um, it was thrilling. Every day was a new challenge. There was always some mountain in the distance that needed to be climbed. And I loved the fact that nobody knew how to do anything. And so your number one task was figuring out how to do something new. And that was super exciting. Um, many, some of you may work at large, large companies or large public companies. And, you know, after one year of that, that was enough for me. Um, getting an MBA is something that I always wanted to do. Um, you know, spending five years in undergrad, I had a great time. And so I was looking to go back. Um, but it was really hard to justify on that startup journey because I felt like we were shooting to the moon. Um, and how could I leave a situation where I was learning so much? Um, so eight years later, it was the right chance. And I was starting to look around. I was at kind of a different spot in my life. Um, I was out of my 20s and in my early 30s and married. And so it was also kind of a family decision at that point. Um, some things that were really important to me is I knew for this next chapter of my life that I had, you know, worked in a startup, done a lot of exciting things, and now I wanted to start a startup. Um, so I was really looking for a university with an ecosystem that was really strong in entrepreneurship um, and not just the business school, but the university as a whole. I had gone to public school prior, had a great experience, and I knew that there were lots of opportunities available at public school. So I was pretty much predominantly looking more towards large public universities. Um, other things that were important to me was the quality of the education. Um, so business school isn't cheap, as we all know. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I was learning from the best. The professors at Rady come from top business schools. Um, and if you ask them why, and I do all the time because I think it's interesting, I think there's a few things. Rady's a young program. They have a lot of autonomy over what they're teaching, how they're teaching. Um, it's a research institution, um, so there's a lot of creativity in that and how they present their work. And then finally, you get to live in San Diego, which being from rainy Portland, Oregon, is freaking awesome. Um, it's in the 70s today. Even though I'm wearing a sweatshirt, I'm sitting inside. Um, I've adapted. So now we're 70 is cold, where 65 used to be warm to me. And then finally, the last thing that's really important to me is... Um, I was when I was working, I was in a situation where I was around a lot of really strong uh, female leadership. We had a lot of women in leadership positions in my company, and I really think that helped me grow. Um, and by the time we were acquired by this large public company, it was not uh, there was not a good gender balance there. Um, and I, I quickly saw that a lot of my uh, mentors, a lot of my colleagues had quickly exited because that was not the right environment for them anymore. And so it was important to me also to go to a place that really embraced and celebrated women in leadership roles and in business. And that is what eventually led me to Rady. My, um, <clears throat> as I was evaluating different schools, my husband was also super stoked to move to Southern California. So that really helped as well. Oh, oh gosh, I think you're on mute, Kim. Something happened. God, I hope oh. I wasn't on mute that whole time. No, just a, <laughs> you said you something about you have, your husband wanting to live in Southern California. So it was kind of a win-win. Yeah. yeah. When we looked at all the places, you know, Washington, D.C. was on the list for a while. And he's like, oh, man. So happy to end up here. Um, what would you like me to focus on next? Well, you know, before I ask some questions, I did, I did not mention um, another colleague who is here today. Uh, prior, so I'm going to introduce him now. His name is Tim Schwartz. He is the executive director of the California Institute for Innovation and Development, which is the organization and the center that houses um, Rady's accelerators, the New Venture Fund, the Social Impact Program, and he also is um, very aware and, and knowledgeable about the other parts of UC San Diego that focus in entrepreneurship. And so I wanted to introduce him. Thank you so much for coming, Tim. And I, I know you're a big fan of Kim's as well. Yep. So we appreciate the support. Yep. I'm, uh, our program is, we're going to finally give it a name that people understand. So you can just understand it as the Center for Entrepreneurship, because the current acronym and name, well, let's just say it didn't follow good business practices. Um, but I look forward to talking with any of you who are interested in understanding what Rady has to offer and our connections to other parts of campus, which are highly interdisciplinary. And actually the most important part is our connections to the external community and the networks and expertise that we can bring to bear to help you think about your entrepreneurial venture, whether it's to start a company or go be sort of an entrepreneur within existing organizations. So I'm available for questions uh, at any time now or later. I'll put my email into the chat. Thank you so much. 
so much, Tim. We appreciate it. Um, I imagine you'll be able to add some um, extra information that, that I'm going to ask Kim because I know you were part of her world here at Rady as well. So, Kim, I guess the first question I have is, um, you know, I'd like for you to tell us about, you know, Algian Materials and, and kind of how you started that, what process you went through, and I, I you know, and, and how you managed to do that your first year. So that's a long question. So let's just start like a little bit about the company and, and you know, did you have the idea before you came? And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, I knew I wanted to go back to school to, to start a company. And my background is in B2B software. And so I honestly thought that I would most likely be starting a software company. Um, that's what I know. That's what I understand. Even though I'm not a developer, I've worked with a lot of developers. Um, so that was kind of the natural path. When I got here, though, you know, it was kind of interesting. I had expected to start a full-time in-person program. Thank you, COVID. Uh, that quickly got derailed, and we were online. And, you know, I came from an office environment where we were in-person. Um, and so it was, it was kind of, it was difficult. It was difficult for me, definitely. It was much more intentional in making connections. And finally, I started to break through a little bit more and, and talk to more people. And this was in the early days too. So before the vaccine, so people, you know, were a little bit more hesitant to meeting up with strangers in person. Um, and so I started talking to some of my, my cohort mates and uh, I met uh, my co-founder, Rose Fine, who was also looking to start her own company. And funny enough, she kind of had a more of a software background too. Um, but we got introduced to kelp and seaweed by a cohort member of ours. So he was really stoked. He wanted to a big surfer, a big ocean person, and wanted to start a seaweed farm, kelp farm. Um, and you know, I'm I'm from the city. Farming does not sound exciting to me, so I wasn't too interested in that. But what I was interested in is what you can do with it. So um, as you know, it's in a lot of our food. You can eat a plain. It's additives. It's in pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's in fertilizers, it can be in biofuels. What I was really interested to learn is that it's in plastics as well. And so it seemed like a natural fit. I'd come from, in the environmental space, I'd come from a background in fintech, and that's really like printing money. And while, you know, we're good at it, it, it doesn't really feel good. We weren't doing anything good for the world or for the environment. Um, having the opportunity to kind of take traditional petroleum-based plastics out of the environment is something that I feel good about every day. Um, so <clears throat> I joined up with them. We started, we joined um, a boot camp that was a three way partnership between the Rady School of Management, Scripps um, Institution of Oceanography, and the Jacobs School of Engineering. And they kind of whipped us into shape. Uh, so you come in with an idea, and the, every week you have homework. Not for, it's not a class. It's not for credit. Um, and we're with a whole bunch of other groups, and they kind of helped us start working on our business plan. And from there, it was good. We learned early on that you know our group kind of had some different ideas, and so we kind of split. And so my co-founder Rose and I continued on. Um, we started Algeo Materials, and we have been going through a series of incubators and accelerators building out our plan um, and what we're doing. And so I can give you guys some background. So what, what the company is, is it's using organic um, and sustainably sourced materials to go ahead and create a bio, a bioplastic that can replace those traditional plastics. So it's kind of a hard substance. And what we're looking at now is to go ahead and sell to B2B brands. We're thinking retailers and consumer packaged good companies and really be an alternative for them in terms of their packaging and containers. Yeah. So, how did you first? So, you, you, since you you met your, you know, you kind of found your your partners and then you know kind of slimmed it down, but you met them through your cohort, so that the people that entered the class with you, right? I did. And then, and how did you how did you find out about this um, kind of this triple partnership? How did you become aware of that? Because that isn't some, you know, that's I'm sure it's not just a flyer on the wall. Yeah, I for for one thing for me is I sign up for a lot of newsletters, honestly. And so I whenever I'm I'm reading about a program that sounds interesting or I want to learn more, the first thing I do is I, I sign up for their newsletters and then I actually skim the emails when they come to me, which I've learned a lot of people no longer read emails. It's kind of interesting. 
Um, and so with that, there's a few entrepreneurship kind of hubs on campus. Um, Rady has one, Jacobs has one, Scripps has one, um, and they do a lot of stuff together. But there's also the Office of Commercialization and Innovation. I think I might've said that right on campus. And that serves UCSD as a whole. Um, they have their own incubator and accelerator programs, and they have something called The Basement, um, which does a very nice newsletter and rolling um, out programs, as well as um, Tim's program as well, Seed, soon to be rebranded, um, puts out a nice email as well. And so through those, you're really starting to learn about different opportunities that are available. I honestly think, and I don't know if this was a pandemic thing or if it's an always thing, but I I. I think a lot of people probably self-regulate on whether or not they should apply. And I'm one of those people who are very bullish. I, I will apply even if I don't think I'm qualified. <laughs> um, and I think I get more opportunities because of that. I think there are probably more opportunities available than people realize maybe off the bat. I'm gonna ask Tim to chime in a little bit. So Tim, you know, you've done some work on sort of, um, making it more uh, easy for students to find these resources and also to have access to them. Can you briefly explain how, you know, what a new student can expect if that's, what, you know, if they're looking to launch something in their first year? Um, can you kind of give us a, a, you know, a background of what you've been able to accomplish since you've been here in that respect? Yeah, I think, first of all, to Kim's point, the world belongs to those people who show up. So um, showing up and just being a part of a community is, is, is critical. And we are working really hard to build a more sort of robust, supportive community campus-wide. We're gonna move, we're hoping to move to last Fridays of the month, student entrepreneurial networking, just at different key locations around campus uh, to increase just the social networking aspects. I'm actually working with Kim's she heads up the market, a marketing club. And um, lots of students have expressed frustrations in knowing where to go, what, you know, who's offering what, what are the right on-ramps, where are the right sort of sources of, of information. So we're gonna pass over a set of assets that another student has developed that represents all the stuff going on that are that it's interesting to students on campus and try to represent that in a way that's more tangible and digestible for students. Um, ultimately, you know, the two big, I'm being somewhat facetious, but the two biggest problems on campus are parking, that's any campus, and communication, that is also any campus. So trying to find a single tool, a venue, or channel in which to communicate all the entrepreneurial opportunities on campus is really hard. Uh, I've seen one campus do it really well through a cool app. I'm not sure that we're ready to do that, but um, showing up and just being aware is, is critical, and we're, we're trying to make that as easy as possible um, in, in our collaborations with scripts, with all the programs that Kim just mentioned. Um, so just sign up, as Kim said, show up and help us understand what makes things easier for you. I also wanna just emphasize one thing, Christina, that it is unusual that people have ideas in their first year. Um, it's unusual, frankly, for students to launch a company at any point, um, at least soon after they leave school. Um, and I've helped a number of students do that uh, with some substantial success um, and with some substantial failure. But failure is also a part of learning. Um, in fact, investors like to see that you failed once or twice before actually putting money into a company that, you, that they expect uh, you will lead to success. So don't be intimidated by the idea that entrepreneurship is just about launching a new venture. It's about more than that. Um, and we're trying to create as inclusive and welcoming a community for any kind of person, any background, any level of experience with respect to entrepreneurship and, and venture creation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, so I hear you in that not, not every student comes in, you know, I think, but I guess my big question is, you know, we have lab to market and it sort of, you know, sounds like, okay, we're gonna go through year one, we're gonna learn all this cool mm. base curriculum. And then, and then the second year I can really get going on this idea. So what, you know, what I want to demonstrate or, you know, have illustrated in some way that it doesn't have to be that way for students. If, and even if you didn't have, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you didn't have an idea, but you knew that it was something, this entrepreneurship and this, you know, a collaboration between business and innovation um, 
if you wanted to learn more about that, you don't really have to wait for your second no. year. And I want to know more about the resources. Like for instance, yeah. you know, Kim went out and she just hounded them down and found them. And yeah. not everybody's going to be like that. But you know, if you had the, uh, you know, if you're like, okay, listen, I, I know my first year is intense. And you know, whether you're a full-time student or a flex student, the lot going on in your life, but um, you don't need to create, they, they don't need to work in partnership, the lab to market, and then these other resources. They certainly can, but given you have two, you know, two years here only, um, it would be a shame to miss out, in my opinion, on, on some of these resources for an entire year. Um, yeah. And then only have so one of, more year to do with them to, you know, the, the coursework and then the additional work. So one of the things that we expect to launch, maybe even pilot this uh, spring, but we expect to launch in fall is our two different levels of, of content provider provision, if you will. So right now, the, the smallest bite you can get to get a flavor for what entrepreneurship is about is a full class or a multi-week commitment, whether it's in the basement or even our programs, our startup programs. I'm going to be starting a series. It's called the Lean Workshop Series. Where, you can, where it's a la carte. You don't have to sign up for the whole series. You can come in and pick, oh, I wanna understand investing. It's a white belt level. Let's use the martial arts analogy. It's the white belt level. I just wanna get a flavor for what new venture investing is about. I wanna get a flavor for what intellectual property is about. I wanna get a flavor for what design thinking and design thinking's interface with entrepreneurship is about. The number of topics is wide and that'll be sort of a white belt level training. And the idea is you come in with like-minded students you pick which ones you want to attend. You don't attend those you don't have time for. So it's pick and choose. And then there's networking involved. I believe in networking for everything. The next level will be what I'm calling sort of the catalyst clinics. And the catalyst clinics, again, you pick which ones you want to come to, but they, they're green belt level content. So they'll dig deeper into a particular topic. So if you want to know, know more about what venture investing is about, we'll dig, you know, rather than the six inch one foot level for the white belt, we're going to go three or four feet down and deep on a particular topic. These are gonna be a la carte. You can come in, pick what you want. Now, all of that being said, I'm also talking to actually primarily MBA program, but other parts of Rady as well, that we may be able to stitch some of these together so you get credit for these. Um, one to two units of credit if you stitch some of these together. And then lastly, I'll share one other program that is actually, it's, it's firing informally on all cylinders right now. Um, and Kim may appreciate this. I don't think she even knows about it. Um, we are starting a venture intern program where I'm sourcing needs of small companies, mostly out of UCSD, but not exclusively, who, for example, need their financials done for them, the first set of pro forma financials. They need some deep market research done for them. Um, they need their ac some accounting work done for them. So these are projects that the companies don't have bandwidth to take on, take on themselves, but they're perfect sort of intern-based, tightly scoped projects for Rady students. So call it four to six weeks, four to eight weeks, four to five hours a week. You might do it as a team. You might take it on by yourself. But we scope the project, put it out there. You raise your hand and apply. We put you together with a founder, ideally lay over a mentor over the whole project, and you dig in and do that work. Those, I'm hoping, I am providing very small, almost token stipends for those right now. I hope to be able to provide more funding. So maybe by the time you're here, those will be, will be a little more generous in supporting your time on those projects. We are also looking at positioning those as independent studies where you can get credit. So that's, those are some ideas that are germinating and, and, and uh, hopefully will be well in place by the time you arrive in fall. Oh, one other thing. I'm also talking to the MBA program about a more exciting content rich networking opportunity at orientation. So we wanna bring it in from the day you arrive. We would love that because we all know what networking means and um, it's definitely a huge part of your MBA experience. And that's hopefully most of you recognize that if you don't, you will, <laughs> wherever you decide to go, hopefully here. Um, oh, I will you know, can I make one other point that you that I neglected and that you brought up? If you don't have your own idea, but you still want to be part of an entrepreneurial venture, there's a lot of matchmaking we can do with students in engineering that need that sort of business mind or business sense. There's a, even Rady students coming together, students from biology, students from the School of Medicine, students from Scripps. So even if you don't have that idea, but you want to be a part of a team, 
there's a lot of matchmaking opportunities as well. Um, and but just to clarify, if someone's like, listen, I don't have an idea and I don't want to be in a group. I just want to take this one class, the yep. white belt yep. level. They can do that, right? Yep. And that just even just one more even just one lecture. You want to come in for an hour and network after that. You just want to understand one particular topic, or you can take all of them. Like I said, it's a la carte. You come in for what you want. I want to address one question in the chat, then I want to get back to Kim. The question is, um, and this relates to what you just said, Tim, about the internships. Is it possible to combine a STEM and entrepreneur, like STEM and entrepreneurship kind of activities as an international student? And of course it definitely is. We have a lot of international students with fantastic ideas with an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, what Tim was talking about just now, the internship, um, while you're in school as an F1 student, that does pose a few problems, but if we are able to get it to be a credit-based experience, you could easily take part in that. The, the issue with the F1 is that you're really only able to work after year one unless you're on campus. And I there's so much there's so much red tape to be able to try to turn something Tim's working into to a, a campus job. But if we could do something like that, it's that's just a brand new thing I didn't even know about, but that would be fantastic. And as far as just you know being an international student and taking part in these activities, there's absolutely no, no difference. All of these are available to all students. Um, and then, and are, and I, sorry. Oh, yeah, um, there was another question from Amit. I'll address that in a little bit, um, but I do want to ask him a few more questions. Um, but, but yeah, Tim, you, you wanted to follow up? No, I was going to speak to Amit's question too, but go ahead. Oh yeah, do you mind? If, so I guess the question that I really want to ask is, you know, I've been through my MBA program, granted it was 100 years ago, but you know, that first year is, is you know, particularly if you're not a business background, you don't have one, there's a lot to learn and it's intense. And, um, you know, most of the time, what I hear, not he, not just here, but, every, you know, people kind of put these extra, extra curricular, i.e. not class activities, um, on the back burner, because they're kind of overwhelmed with the classwork and, you know, just the new, new environment. My big question is, how, how did you manage to do all of this your first year? And I know it was remote, but still the workload may have even been more because you didn't have the opportunity to meet at the water cooler. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. So I came from uh, working probably, I don't know, maybe 50 to 60 hours a week. Um, and so I guess I was used to having a really busy full schedule. And I also lived near my family. So I had a, <clears throat> a lot of family time happening all the time as well. And so when I got to Rady, um, I, I know firsthand that maybe, maybe Christina and Tim should plug their ears. Like nobody cares about grades. They really don't like, no, I know. Nobody cares unless, about unless you're going into ah. consulting or, or venture, think. venture finance, or maybe a big four accounting firm, nobody cares. And so like killing yourself over getting perfect grades, I personally think is a waste of time. That's maybe that could be me. Um, but all these other opportunities are, are really important. Um, and so looking for, looking for areas where you can grow and network and especially like if things, things, will, I don't know, I can't predict the future. I would personally prepare for hybrid, um, for the next little bit. Um, and so making sure that you can meet other people that you feel comfortable around. It's hard to build trusted relationships when you only meet people through zoom, um, in all of those clubs, all the socials, all of those weird meetups where you feel kind of awkward walking in the first time. I, I think those are incredibly important and I would spend a lot of time on that. Um, I, for me, I know like I block out time. So I have a class where I, I gotta write a bunch of papers right now. Um, and writing for me isn't particularly difficult but I just block out time. I say, I'm giving myself an hour and a half to work on this and that's it. Like at the end of the day, if I get an A, if I get a B on it, I don't, I don't care. It's fine. Like that's what I'm blocking my time for. And then I'm going to move on and work on something else. And I think it's really important um, in school to follow, follow your passions on things that you, you might not do otherwise. So for example, I took a blockchain class in healthcare. I don't ever plan to work in healthcare. 
I don't have any desire to work in healthcare, um, but I was interested in learning about the blockchain. I know nothing other than kind of what I read in the news. And that was really inter- that was super interesting class. And I learned a lot. And I think now I could have definitely a, a more intelligent conversation on the topic. Um, so I would recommend stretching it and kind of going into areas uh, like that. And, and honestly, as lame as it sounds, just like making the time, making the time to meet people and, and do things outside of just class. Follow up on just I, I want I want everyone here to know the successes you've had thus far with your organization. I know you've 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 been recognized by a number of nonprofits and organizations across the country that are trying to move the economy and more of a you know the focus on sustainability. Um, you know I'd love it if you could just sort of fill fill in the group about where the company is now um, and you know what you think the MBA is going to do for you in the future. And then I, then I definitely think we should move to questions. Okay, yeah, so t- talk a little bit about where LG on Materials is today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we've been working on this now for about a year. So it started eh, last February is kind of like really kind of getting started. We applied for the Triton Innovation Challenge, um, which I honestly don't know which school that is ran out of. Maybe Tim will know. I don't, it might be Scripps. Um, it's, we, Rady leads it, but it's, uh, Jacob's scripts oh, okay. and reading all at once. It's like the perfect, perfect three-way team there. Yep. Um, so we we applied for that and we made it into the final rounds and that got us really excited. Um, and so then I went whole hog wild on applying for pitching co- uh, competitions. One thing that's nice as an MBA student is you get a lot of experience um, in public speaking. I've also been in Toastmasters for several years. Highly recommended if you need to work on public speaking. It's great. Um, it's one of those things that feels awkward at first too, but it's worth it in the end. Um, and so we actually do pretty well at pitch competitions. So we've been able um, to, to win a few um, or get pretty far in a few, um, get some press, get some money and kind of get going. One thing that's really exciting about starting a company that's focused on the blue economy um, is that people are really excited about it. And so people are often offering to help us, whether that's be advisors or supporters, um, I've been spending a lot of time talking to investors lately. I am excited. Our, our plan is to raise a round of funding here, probably in Q4 of this year. So it won't be until the fall. We have some milestones that we need to hit. Our material is in the prototyping phase, um, but we're looking to get it into the lab environment for some mechanical testing, um, as well as then go through some, some manufacturing. So a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon. I am currently in the lab to market series right now. <clears throat> lab to market seems to be a class that series that is always evolving. Um, and so right now I'm with my co-founder. We have a couple more of our cohort members working with us. Um, and we're just continuing to build out the business case and the business plan, which is really great. Um, one, one of the reasons why I wanted to start a company while I was in school is because I know the power of an EDU email address. And so I have talked to executives at Starbucks and Nikes and Tom's and REI, uh, Clorox, and they'll all talk to me because I email them from my student email address. Um, And so that is, I think if you, you know, you'll learn in entrepreneurship, whether you want to or not to, (laughs) um, about customer research. And so that's incredibly valuable. The other thing, Christina, I don't know if I hit on this well enough, but I think a lot of people wait till they have a perfect idea before they move forward to the right team. It's better just to get started because it's messy. And I, there's some stat I can't remember, but I think like the average pivots um, a company makes is like six to eight. And that's kind of like the ideal number to like get to where you want to be. And it's just because as you learn something, something changes. So for example, when we started, we're like, okay, we're going to be only a materials company we are going to create a raw material and we're going to sell to manufacturers through wholesalers. Well, you know, after doing a lot of research, talking to a lot of companies, meeting with plastic manufacturers, talking to wholesalers, talking all over the place, we're like, okay, I think actually we probably need to go to market first with a product um, and kind of back our way into that value chain. And then in terms of like, I know somebody else asked this, I think maybe in the chat, if you have more of an engineering background, if you have an engineering background, an MBA is great. So I had, I had a little bit of a different story because I already had a business background. And so a lot of the classes for me are about learning about other parts of business that I just wasn't in the weeds in. 
So like finance and accounting, I've always joked that I'm allergic to it. Um, I might still be a little allergic to it, but it's important to, it's important to understand like, you know, you know, the state, you know, the financial statements and how they work and how they tie together. Um, not because I ever plan to do those things, but I need to understand how they're impacting my business um, and make sure I understand what somebody else is doing too. Um, and so I think, you know, if you have a business background or if you don't, just getting kind of that wide um, breadth of experience across all your classes is really great. Oh, Christina, I think you're on mute. Thanks. Yeah, I'm on mute. Um, thank you for answering that question. Um, and I know we have a couple others. So we are we are rolling out for the end of our little session. I don't know if either of you have a few extra minutes to stay if people yeah. have questions. Um, so I guess the, the um, someone asked a question about um, creating an innovative mindset. While they're here, another asked a question about setting up a manufacturing plant in San Diego. And, and then um, I'm answering the question about just some basics to prepare for an MBA. I think that's a great idea if you're not familiar with the environment and the language. And I, I put some out there. It's always a good idea to be reading um, <clears throat> journals and publications. I prefer the Financial Times. It does take a you know, global view. Um, and some of the problems, it tends to be a little bit more objective. Um, it's the orange newspaper. Um, if you haven't seen that before, it's worthwhile. The Economist. But let's let's talk about um, how how can we help people develop an innovative kind of mindset. Um, so what one thing I really liked when I came to when I came to school is I believe it was Dean Ordonez was you know was teaching the excel she's an excel wizard so she's like oh i'm going to teach the you know kind of like an excel refresher which right. yeah. if, you should, if you haven't done excel in your job you, you should probably youtube a few videos before you get here um because you will need to down basic excel um but she said something that i hadn't really done before and it's when you get inputs um is question where they came from <laughs> which I, I don't know why, but like whenever I received information at my last job, like unless I thought the person was a little suspicious, I never really questioned it. I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is the right information. But that was one of the first things I learned to do here, which seems really basic, but it's just to question where the, where the information's coming from, what is the material, what assumptions were made, and then how that then starts to impact your ability to you know, think critically about the material, analyze it, and come up and you know, kind of come up with your solution or conclusion or whatever you're working on. Tim, can you comment on the, I, I really don't know if I can comment on the manufacturing plant question. I think that's a larger question that would probably need to be addressed outside of this particular venue. It, it kind of I requires think, sort of a- Yeah, I think well, it's- You did, I mean, you are setting up, so Kim, you, I guess part of that stemmed from what you said about setting up some you know, you have your prototypes and um, yeah, I obviously at some point you're going to need to. Yeah, I think it's, I think the manufacturing plant is super interesting. I can just tell you from the research I've done, there's a whole bunch of manufacturing plants in Southern California right now. There's all different types. I've been primarily looking for injection molding and plastic plants. Um, so I, 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 my guess is your question is a little bit more nuanced and you might, um, you might already have something in mind. But so I don't know, maybe we, maybe I'll, you, I'll put my email in and you can, um, you can email me if you want, we can talk about that offline, but I do think that that's a bit of an interesting question. And then I did want to say something to Sergio, who was asking about being an international student. Um, a lot of my classes are obviously with international students, and I don't know if this is true for the F1 visa, so I might be speaking out of turn here, but I know those students have been starting companies back in their home countries. And I don't think that affects the F1 visa. So like I took a class with um, a, a woman, uh, we took an e-commerce class, excellent. If you also wanna start an e-commerce business, highly recommend it. Um, I took it, learned I don't wanna start an e-commerce business, but um, she uh, had taken everything she learned and opened up uh, a business with her sister back in Saudi Arabia, which I thought was super interesting. Can I open a business in the United States can I also <clears throat> comment, yeah. comment on a couple of things? Um, there are a lot of prototyping and makerspaces on campus. 
um, and there may be another one coming online soon, but there are, um, there are several that are available to students. To the, um, let's see where to go. Um, innovative mindset, uh, Kathy, um, that's, that's a phenomenal question. Um, and that's at the core of what I try to convey and offer. It's not just about, you know, as I said, entrepreneurship is a lot more than just about venture creation. It is fundamentally about a mindset. And that mindset is, it can be defined differently depending on who you talk to, but it's how you look at the world, identify problems, identify opportunities. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily yield dollars, right? It could be for social impact, right? How do you look at the world and, and see problems, see opportunities and approach solutions to those opportunities? How risk averse or risk taking are you? How resilient are you? How, per, how, how do you persevere in the face of challenges? How good a communicator are you? All of these factors play into, into an entrepreneurial mindset in addition to many more. Uh, and, but that is, that is, I think, key to any education, no matter what it, whether it's an MBA or an MD. Frankly, it's, it's to have an innovation, innovative entrepreneurial mindset, I think really does uh, bear out well for anybody who's willing to, to, to look at things creatively. Very much. Um, I have a question from the from the audience. If it says it's not in the chat, um, Ted, um, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Christina and Gerard, for organizing this. I really appreciate this. And Kim and Tim for your very insightful thoughts. Um, my question is actually directed at Kim, but um, coming from an artistic background, um, I'm coming coming from the opposite side of you where um, I've been working in the arts as an opera singer for the last you know, mm. 10 years. And um, during COVID built uh, a business that sought to produce really high quality videos at an affordable rate for artists. And Thankfully, uh, during the last you know two years, we've collaborated some of the largest arts organizations in the state. So that's been great. But I haven't, you know, I don't have a business background, um, which is why I'm looking to do my MBA. And so I was wondering if you could answer by chance, um, you know, how you transitioned into getting into the business mindset from the artistic side, um, and and what that looked like for you, other than just going into like international business degree. Yeah. I think having an artistic background is an immense benefit. I think it allows you to see creative solutions where others may not, um, and it allows you to think outside of the box. Um, so in transitioning to a, a, a business mindset, I think you want to be careful not to lose that edge of creativity you have, because not everyone has that. That is definitely unique. I threw a few links into the chat. I would start by, um, by catching up on on some industry news and terminology. So, you know, my guess is looking at the group here that many people speak multiple languages, um, which is an asset. And I think you learn um, when you're learning a foreign language, I've tr been learning, tried to speak Spanish for like 15 years, you know, I'm, I'm at where I'm at. But um, it, one of the biggest things that it feels really intimidating is when you don't know the vocabulary, when you don't understand the terminology and nothing in business is rocket science, but people start throwing around these words and these acronyms and you feel like an idiot because you don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, so I think one of the things you could really do to help yourself is to start learning, start learning the vocabulary, learning the terminology. Um, and some easy ways to do that are to read some books. I, I used to read all the time and now I feel like I don't have as much time anymore. I don't know why. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, so I would find some good podcasts that you could do, like maybe when you're doing chores or working out, um, that you can listen to, to kind of help get that. I also subscribe to a few, um, email newsletters that are really brief and I just kind of read them quickly, um, through the day. My favorite right now is the morning brew. It's out of, um, it's out of an MBA from, uh, Michigan Ross who started it. And it's kind of turning into kind of a big media company now, um, but that will just kind of give you the highlights. And I think those kinds of things of slipping into a business mindset would be really helpful. Um, and taking the time to reflect as you learn things too. So one of the, the great things about having experience, anybody who has experience here in the workforce is you'll go through a class and you'll be like, oh, that's what happened. I remember I was in my organizational strategy class. We were talking about how organizations are designed or something. And they use the word, they're like, oh, a matrix organization. And I had honestly never heard that. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, that's what we were. 
but I didn't, I didn't know that until I had heard that term. And so I think, um, I think taking the time to, to educate yourself and I, I would probably do it passively, at least that's how I would do it. Um, again, through listening, um, would be really helpful. Someone had a question. I know people are probably going to have to, to sign off, but um, I actually put something in the chat as a finance person. Investopedia is super great if you're confused about financial terms, accounting terms. That is where a lot of those acronyms come from. Um, and so you might want to spend some time there. It's free. Um, we did have a question about, you know, in addition, obviously, we have these exter external resources to students, but what about the classes? Can, can you comment on sort of what you're learning on that entrepreneurial space from our classes. Yeah, um, I'm going to throw in one more link real quick for anybody who doesn't have a good quantitative background. And God, the last time I took a math class was like literally 15 years ago. So I was a little weak. Um, the Khan Academy is real good for catching up and it's free. Um, MBAMath.com. Oh, there's oh, another God. one too. Yeah. So if you need to get up the, the bell curve quickly, maybe, and it's all online based. So, you know might work your way through that. Um, yes, sorry, Christina, back to your question. So you were asking about classes. So one thing that I, I've tried to do very purposefully is take classes that help my business. Um, so every class I'm taking, I'm trying to make sure it has a direct impact. So this quarter I'm taking new venture finance. Awesome. It's all about how VCs um, value companies um, and what investments look like and what term sheets look like. And then from the entrepreneur perspective, how you should be looking at things, how much equity you're giving away. Great. As I told you, I'm kind of allergic to math. There's not a lot of complicated math here. It's more about understanding what's happening. Um, enjoying that class. I'm taking an independent study. I've done quite a few independent studies where I'm doing some financial modeling. Um, spoiler alert, the example business is my business. Um, so that's great for us. Uh, and we're working with an accounting um, professor, Eric Floyd, who's I believe might be the head of that department. Don't quote me on that. Um, lab to market is always is building out business cases. Um, there's a really great class negotiations. Highly recommend everyone take it. You go away for a weekend at a hotel, which at this point I'm starving for human interaction. Um, and it's, it's two and a half days and it's like nine to nine. And it's, it's live, it's like live simulations and it's great. Um, and so that's a great class. And that will teach you how to negotiate everything from negotiating salaries to business deals, to thinking about complex situations. Um, also a great class. And then another class I'm taking this term is like CEO and board governance. And so one of the things I was sensitive to in my last job was is our board of directors um, got a little unruly towards the end, which probably honestly likely led to our sale. Um, and so wanting to make sure I understand how board of directors, directors are structured um, and what you can kind of do to keep them in check. And so that's one thing, Christina, I've been doing is looking through the catalogs. Um, uh, Ravy right now, I don't know if anybody talks about this, maybe from a, a professional level, but there's a lot of chat going on. We use WhatsApp kind of as an MBA cohort as a whole. Um, as a school. And the reason why is there's a lot of international students, so it just makes it easier. And people are very honest about uh, classes that they like and why they like them. I would also tell you that you should always take a good professor. Like if there's a professor who is outstanding, um, and people will tell you, um, I would almost always err to take their class over maybe something else. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I know we're... Um... We're, we're kind of running out of time. We actually ran out of time seven minutes ago. Um, if, if we don't have any more questions, um, I'd like to, if, if we do, please let me know um, right now. <laughs> um, and you can always reach, I'm trying to do something here. I'm not sure what's making the thing. You can always reach me. I'm gonna put my chat, my email into the chat. Um, I know that uh, Tim already did that. And Gerard, can you please do that too? Uh, Gerard and I can both answer your questions about anything MBA related. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you all for coming. I think we're very lucky to have this opportunity to talk to Kim. It's not every day that you have someone in the program that's doing exactly what we talk about um, while here and to have the chance to ask questions and really get a, a real sense of what it's like to be in the thick of it. So thank you so very much, Kim. I really appreciate your time. 
Um, and Tim, I, Tim and Kim, Tim, I thank you too for your input and kind of rounding out the corners of our conversation. Um, so again, anyone else also should mention, anyone that did attend, we've taken um, attendance and you will receive an application fee waiver. It is a $200 fee waiver, so you, that's, that's great. Um, the one person that's in as a Zoom user, I don't know your name, so I will not be able to do something for you unless you write to me. And like, if you can write me in the next 10 minutes and tell me you, that was you, then we can help you out. All right, so thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you so much to our guests.